I'm John Franklin. I am the CEO of the World Pro Ski Tour. We are in the midst of a revitalization of the tour. The tour was, I'd say, the dominant professional ski racing tour. Started in 1969 by Bobby Eddy. Ran super strong through about 2002 when uh, some business things happened and uh, went on the back burners for a while. Three years ago, it was resurrected. And now we're increasing the prize money, increasing the television. We love this form of racing because you can tell who wins. It's dual racing. You've got guys side by side, 50 miles an hour, over bumps. And the great thing is the guy who crosses the finish line first goes on to the next round, single elimination. Here it's head to head, drag racing on snow. So the Rural Pro Ski Tour format's really interesting because uh, it's unlike normal racing where there's just one person going down racing the clock. This is just head-to-head -head racing and doesn't matter what your time is, first person across the line wins the race. Basically the World Pro Ski Tour differs quite a bit from our normal racing um, where it's just you racing against the clock. Now you've got someone standing right next to you at the start gate going at the exact same time as you and you're racing them to the bottom. It's, it's a competition against someone else for the first time ever in the sport. That I've found and it's it's a lot more stress on the course than like when you're doing it just by yourself so it's it's a little more pressure while you're in the race course but it's a lot more fun like you get to the bottom and you can see instantly if you're behind or in front you can pump your fist at the bottom because you know instantly that you just had a good run you're advancing so it's it's a little different that way but it's definitely a more fun environment a little less uh in your own head. Waking some moves, but here comes Thriller, and he gets an arm behind him. I think head-to-head -head definitely has a, like a different appeal to it. Um, I really enjoy the normal racing, and that's the reason I'm, I'm here doing head-to-head -head is because of the normal racing was around before, and then this started up for the Pro Tour. But it's just, it's a different mentality in it. You're, you're going against someone, you can see it, you can visibly hear them behind you breathing down your neck. It's a little bit more intense, and it makes you like, you kind of you get a little more of a excitement every time you're going out of the gate. I think, you know, you have that guy in your peripheral vision. Ideally, he's not in your vision because then you're ahead of him. Uh, but if he's there, then you know you got to, you know, pick up your game or find find something within to go faster. And that's something I've always been able to do for the most part. You know, you see a guy ahead, you figure out a way to go faster. When you're on your own in a slalom course, you kind of have to trust that you're skiing fast, but sometimes you're not. And, and you won't know until you get to the finish line. So um, it's that instant feedback of either you're skiing well or you're skiing slow. I think it is the most fun version of ski racing by far, um, head to head, but also just the culture and atmosphere outside is super fun. You kind of can space on what you're working on and just get really competitive and it leads to exciting racing. The first pro tour is pretty fun, it's pretty soft, but everything, all the jumps are good. I have no idea what my times work, but... He's got a lot to learn from the pros, a lot to learn. They don't see... I've got four seasons on him. You can't, you, there's, you can't put a money value on that. Uh, yes, please. <laughs> that's just experience. Yeah, you uh, can. I was, just, I was just hustling these you guys today, tomorrow on that. Oh, that's true, you can put about 10 grand on it. It's fun. It's, uh, <laughs> I would say it's, it's real racing. It's always the same conditions for everybody. And it's pure racing. Pro tours are definitely a little different than the normal racing we're in. The format's really cool because you're going head to head against every single other athlete out there and you go from bottom of the bracket all the way up to the top and you, you meet in the middle kind of just like any other bracket system. And it's, it's double elimination. You do one course on the red, one run on the blue, and then the person who gets to the finish line on the second run, he's the guy that won the race. And it's, it's really easy for the public to understand that. It's a little bit easier than just looking up at a time and being like, that's a lot of zeros and then a number. Like, who's ahead, who's behind, the plus, the minus. So it, it makes it a little easier for the, the crowd to watch it and it's a lot more fun for the athletes because you can you can tell right away if you made it or not. Yeah, Robert Cohn really showing that that race sort of belonged to him from the beginning. And it's pretty uh, simple and it's very viewer friendly. You can really see what's going on. There's a lot of action compared to traditional ski racing. It's shorter courses and and with obviously some jumps involved. So it makes for a really exciting race. Like, get Jacob to stay focused on his course on the red side. Being on the World Pro Ski Tour is more of a fulfilling racing experience to me because uh, it's more of a social event. Everyone's really cool. It's like family. It's really fun experience to be in the start gate with 
such a wealth of different personalities and experience levels. It really makes an interesting, you know, race series. So the Pro Tour usually does like a, a two-day event. Um, the first day is a qualifier. So you get all the athletes in the field, go up to the top, and it's seated by the, the members of the Pro Tour first and the guys that have points from years past or the races before. They get to go out of the start gate first, racing against each other, and this is the timed event. So the gate opens, but you're still going through a start gate wand, and that's when your time starts. First person to the bottom, or the fastest time, he gets qualified first. And then he goes to the, the other course, the fastest time in the other course will be qualified second. And then it goes back and forth between red and blue courses, fills out the whole ladder all the way out to 32. And then that day is over, and then you go to the next day and you got the race. So after the qualifying, we have everyone seated one through 32, with the fastest guy going against the slowest and moving through the bracket. So that means your first round, you should have an easier matchup, but a lot of times there can be fast skiers who made a mistake. So you have to always be on your toes from the first round all the way through the finals. 0.085, it's deceiving if you watch. It's competitive, you know? And I would say, for me, it's, it looks like the future for ski racing. If you think a tin shed can hold up like a tough shed, you're in for a big surprise. After 38 years, our buildings speak for themselves. Dream, design, and build at toughshed.com. Here is a place situated off the map of ordinary, a place that is independent, free-spirited, and intimate in scale. A place that since its first lift was installed over 60 years ago, has strived to stay true to its roots while growing better rather than bigger. This vision for the future has helped make us the first ski resort in the world to earn B Corp certification. It's a symbol of where we're headed and what we stand for. We hope you will join us. Attention, Medicare recipients. The Enogen One Portable Oxygen Concentrator may now be available at little or no cost to you. Call 800-792-7133 to order yours today. Enogen Oxygen Concentrators are portable and make oxygen from the air around you. They're light, quiet, and battery operated to go everywhere you go. And we have a full line of portable oxygen units to fit a wide range of budgets. If you're on Medicare, you may even qualify to get your Enogen unit at little or no cost to you. Go back to joining friends for the breakfast special, make spending time with the grandkids easier, or start attending your religious services again. Call Enogen now for a free information kit and a free no obligation consultation on our complete line of affordable portable oxygen products. And anyone on Medicare or with eligible insurance plans may qualify to get an Enogen One at little or no cost. Call 800-792-7133. That's 800-792-7133. The name of this event is the Gramschammer Cup. Pepe Gramschammer was an Austrian ski racer who didn't make the 1960 Olympic team. He came to Vail, there was a fledging pro tour at the time, this village basically wasn't even here yet. And he used his money from winning uh, pro ski races to buy this piece of land on the corner. Interestingly enough, everybody was trying to get right at the base of the lifts. And Pepe's idea was, no, I want to be in the center of town. And that's where he is. He's right at the crossroads of the two main streets in Vail. Earlier in the year, Pepe passed on, but his, his legacy will live forever in Vail. He was like the first citizen of Vail, and it all started from his winnings from the Pro Tour. Well, his, his wife, Shaika, has donated one of his large trophies to the winner of the Gromschammer Cup here in Vail this weekend. So not only are we increasing the prize money of the tour every year, but we've got some great legacy awards that the racers can win. Growing up in Vail, I have gone to his restaurant since I was a little kid. I grew up skiing here when he was a you know, founding member of this ski resort. So it's really cool coming full circle and competing for a 
his trophy. So Pepe won this cup in 1960. And what we're going to do is take that cup, give it to the winner of the Gromschammer Cup, and we're going to engrave the name of every winner. It will be a legacy cup that will be in this trophy case with the winner of a modern race. You know, the legacy carries on. Pepe's legacy carry on in the village into modern times. My name is Alex Lever. I'm uh, 24 years old from Dale, Colorado originally, but I've been living in Denver for seven years now. Position number five, Alex Lever from the United States of America. And My name is Garrett Driller, uh, originally from Lake Tahoe, California, grew up skiing at Squaw Valley, and uh, I graduated from Montana State, so I've been up there for the last five years, so now I'm down in Colorado. And of course, crowd favorite, Mr. Garrett Driller. My first World Pro Ski Tour race was two years ago in uh, Sunday River, Maine. It was the second inaugural one. So I missed the first one. It was at the same time as the NCAA National Championships. So the second year, I got talked into flying out to Dartmouth. I have a lot of friends out there, and they're like, oh, we'll give you a place to stay. It's a lot of fun. And so I ended up going out there. And obviously, having the opportunity to make money at a ski race instead of just paying entry fees and lift tickets and stuff. Being able to walk out with more money in your wallet than you started with is obviously appealing. So that was why we started going into it. And then it's such a fun atmosphere in racing. Like that's what's kept us going, you know, three years later. Feeling good, excited. I'm watching Rob Cohn, the first guy go down right now. See how the course runs. Looks a little soft, but solid. So yeah, it should be fun. I kind of just fell into knowing about the Pro Tour. It was just being done by a lot of my, my friends and athletes. Um, Alex started doing it a year before I did. Um, and it was just like another race series you could do and the possibility of winning prize money just really catches your eye as coming out of college and dirt poor. So you like you notice that this is a race thing, you go to one or two of them and you're like, wow, this is awesome. Let's go, Gary! So I believe there's a 30 grand purse available for this race, which means the race winner will get 10 grand, which is you know obviously a huge number for us and would help us pay for our expenses to travel for all of our racing this year. So me and Alex, we met quite a while back um, while we were both in college. We got named to the national university team on the US team. And I kind of knew of him before that. Um, he came to a couple races out west where I grew up in uh, Sugar Bowl and he was like, Who's this guy? Like, no idea. We didn't really meet each other then. We knew each other's name from start list, and then we we got on the same team um, in college, and we've been basically just inseparable. We've been on the same team ever since then, either on the U.S. team or on the Team America team we're on now. Yeah, he's my roommate back home, so yeah. you know maybe I might steal his keys if he beats me or something. Yeah, we can play some pranks. Yeah. So Garrett and I ended up facing off against each other in almost every race we entered. <laughs> um, I think the first. Both the first two races we raced, we met each other in the semifinals. And then at uh, US Nationals, we met each other. Uh, actually, we were in opposite sides of the bracket. So we were against, we were opposite in the semifinals, but uh, we've each pulled ahead one time. So uh, it's tied 1-1 going into tomorrow. So it'll be pretty fun to see what happens. We have Lever on the blue course now and Driller on red. And you can see already half a gate ahead coming into the first jump. I think Alex got a really good shot, actually. He's been skiing really fast in our training. Um, it's just consistency at this point. So in Pro Tour, it's it's a lot more about if you can have repeatability of good runs, not any mistakes, because the course isn't that long. So if you make one mistake, you're out. So if Alex can hold on for all of them, I have a good shot on him. But otherwise, I've, I'm going for me. The red course is faster, so I had to use it to my advantage. I think I skied well, though. So protect the lead and get that podium. If you face off in the finals, are you winning? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> so I've grown up skiing on this exact race hill since I could walk, essentially. I ski this hill probably 10,000 times, so I hope that I have maybe a slight advantage over the rest of the competition. Yeah, Rob's just smooth. Uh, but the, the course got a little better, I say, for us on that right side. But there's just really nothing you can do when you're skiing against someone that's not going to make a mistake. My goal is to win the tour, but and that's also Garrett's goal. So <laughs> inevitably, one of us is going to uh, come out on top of the other one, but I think we can both do really well this year. You know, I take a one-two finish at the yeah. end of the season standings. I can't, I can't complain getting second behind him, knowing we're both, we're both in the same boat, we're both going for the same goals. Like, either way it works. Obviously, you want to win because that's better, but 
No, it's, it's not against each other, really, ever. Teammates are always rooting for each other. I mean, two races last year, we ended up going against each other in the semifinals, and uh, it's just not serious at all on the start. We're both giving jabs at each other, trying to make the other one laugh right before the game race starts, you know? So uh, it's always a good time. We, uh, we don't let it get to our heads, I don't think, of the competition. Yeah, are you guys a research guy or something? <laughs> Dumb and dumber. <laughs> so you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> I think uh, I think I have a good chance to win. The the conditions are a little soft. I, I grew up in the West Coast on this. Like I, I know what I'm doing. I think I think I could get a really good chance at uh, putting the pain on everyone else. And then it was Garrett Driller and Michael Ankeny. Michael Ankeny has one of the fastest starts of any of these athletes. Notice he's already a half a gate ahead of Driller, but Driller smooth as silk and coming on strong to the finish. He takes it. Uh, Michael, Michael put some uh, some heat on me. I got got a little scared at the bottom, went a little straight just like Phil and almost lost my lead. So, uh, I'm gonna have to show him who's boss this second round. Wasn't that trash talking? You yeah. get inside your head there? A little bit, you know? But, uh, I just didn't expect him to actually, like, follow through. So, we're working with it. We'll get him. Uh, it was good. Good out of the start. Had a little bit of on Garrett, then he pulled it back a little bit towards the end. We're tight, though. I think it's like 200s or something. So this round, I'm just going to try to be more like Garrett and Driller. It's all for fun. We're all just, it's part of the game. No, if I'm not as good of a skier as him, I got to get in his head. Next run, high energy, looking to stay connected to the snow. As it gets a little more rutted, it's easier to get popped. Stay on the ground. Michael Ankeny and Garrett Driller's final run. Ankeny had the advantage on the first run. Driller knew he had to make up some time on the course. Both of them off the first jump, pretty much right on the money. But there goes Driller, trying to really work the ski. Ankeny behind after the last jump. Driller just straightens it out. Ankeny in trouble, and Driller takes it. Garrett Driller today said, you know what, I, I, I've got that energy. Uh, Michael just crushed me out of the start gate again. I need to figure that out. Um, but other than that, I skied well, made my uh, advance on him, and uh, on to the next round. I just like being outdoors. I like racing against all my competitors. It's, it's fun to go fast. Um, but it's also like amazing all the travel and all the people we've met. I've got friends everywhere now. I've got all the guys I went to college with, I've got Austrian, Swedish, Norwegian. I can go any place where there's snow and stay at their houses. I know all their families. Um, like having that as like, a community, I think that's really what's kept me interested in the sport. Honestly, I started because going fast was fun. And now that I've grown older, I, like, I understand ski racing's here, it's part of a community. You got people from all ages that are still doing it. And so you can always find some like-minded person at some ski resort that was like, oh, like, I saw your name on a start list. Like, good job. Like, like, everyone knows either who you are or you know, like, when you see a skier on their hill, like, you're like, that guy used to race. Like, it looks like it. But that's what's so fun about the Pro Tour is it's like a race of all of your friends. So even if you don't win, you can still be happy for the guy who yeah. stands at the top of the podium. But um, you obviously want it to be you because you want to grab that big check and, uh, you know, you always just want to win. That's, we're competitive athletes, so. so yeah, we don't, we don't lose sleep over not winning. It's always a fun, fun game. It's a sport, it's a job, but it's more importantly just fun. That's why we're here. I'm Jake Jacobs, I'm 26. I grew up out on, on West Mountain in upstate New York. Will be Jake Jacobs on the red course. I learned to ski at a very young age. After school, I'd go night skiing. My parents would drop me off at the ski area and I would kind of like disappear. My father was involved in the ski industry and my mom was once a cross country skier. So it kind of runs in the family. I work like a blue collar job in the summertime. I'm a chimney sweep doing like chimneys and fireplaces and things like that. It's, it's a good gig because I can take the winners off and do this. The skis ahead for the second jump. Driller out front now. Jake is going to try to straighten the course out. Driller out front, head for the finish line. The clock will tick down across the line and go. The win for point six zero. How'd that first run go? Not bad. Um, I think I got to, you know, shorten my deflection time, be a little more smooth. Oh, no, Snow is a little soft. As a racer, I'm an independent. I'm not really affiliated with a team. I'm kind of like a journeyman. I just 
go to the races. And last year I bought a van and decked it out and painted it and hit the road solo and just drove across the country like twice. For this race, I drove from New York over here. This is the deep powder assault vehicle from New York. I did it straight, yeah. It was Thanksgiving uh, day and I started in the evening. And so I could get through Chicago and, and like Cleveland, with no traffic. Yeah, the heater's broken, so I would turn on the, the heater to max, and then the, like, the emergency e-brake would go off. So I was like, oh, you know, got like a weird electrical problem. I actually had a situation in uh, Cleveland. My van ran out of like power steering fluid. So it was like in Cleveland in the middle of the night, no steering or brakes. So I had to like pull off into this gas station and you know, fix it up. It's been uh, one thing after another, really. But she's been good to me. So pre-race, I'll usually arrive maybe four days before the event. I'll get a pretty good workout in, in the gym, maybe five days out, take, you know, a whole day if it's just skiing and make myself sore. And then the day before the race day, I like to take a couple runs, let my body recover, and then and then just have full energy for the, the race. Just uh, get everything activated, loosen up, and probably ready to go jogging now. Race day is a late, active, I do like an active routine. I don't want to do too much, but uh, it's usually pretty simple. You know, it's hard in the summer to, to work a full-time job and then also go to the gym and eat. The top-notch guys will have access to training in the summer. They'll go, you know, to the Southern Hemisphere for skiing, you know, like New Zealand or South America and get a lot of miles in on snow. You know, compared to me, I have at this point, seven days on snow. And tomorrow's race day. So I don't really let that bother me. I just, you know, you get in the gate and you just go. You know, you never know what's gonna happen. As long as you stay strong, and you know, you should be good. When I'm in the starting gate, I'm usually eager, you know, to get going. The sequence is red course ready, blue course ready, racers ready, and then the gates will open randomly. So you have to kind of time it. Yep. It's, uh, it's quick. Everything has to be fluid with your mind. You don't really think in words. You just, you just go. You know, it's, it's the ragged edge. You're, you're going as fast as you can without wiping out. What motivates me is just the feeling of turning, like the performance. That Jacob stay focused on his course on the red side. For me, it's just fun. When I go against someone like Phil Brown, I just put the hammer down. Like I, I like to make him nervous. Having the disparity in maybe ability levels or success levels in athletes creates a really interesting dynamic. And at the end of the day, we're all here because we like ski racing and we're all competitors. I'm Phil Brown from Toronto and I'm 28 years old. Mr. Phil Brown from Canada. I grew up skiing just north of Toronto in a small town called Collingwood. Ski racing was just something that we did on the weekends with my family. I made the national team when I was about 18 years old and spent the last nine, 10 years with the team. Competed in two Olympics and three world championships. And now I'm kind of transitioning out of the sport and using the Pro Tour to uh, find a little bit more joy and, and just really have some fun with ski racing, figuring out what I'm gonna do next. <laughs> I came to the first event in Beaver Creek. I ended up coming second, and it really kind of lifted me to bring some motivation into the last six weeks of the season. This kind of brought new light to me, and um, I figured I would go all in on it and do the rest of the events. Going through to Steamboat and Waterville, I won both of those events back to back, both in very different ways and different conditions, and so it was really just, I had some momentum and kept it rolling. And yeah, I mean, it's always fun winning, so <laughs> can't complain about that. A special congratulations to our overall tour champion, Phil Brown. Thank you. Thanks, guys. <laughs> so, you know, what did it take for you to win the overall tour this year? Uh, I mean, I think just a lot of consistency uh, and, and, you know, some good fast skiing and some good competition against the other guys and kept my head in the game the whole way through. The World Cup circuit is obviously, it's massive in Europe, but, but being from North America, we ended up spending, you know, eight to ten months of the year on the road, whether it was training through the summer or obviously racing in the wintertime. 
It definitely has its peaks and valleys. For some people, you end up with a lot more valleys than peaks, and, and I would say that's the majority of racers. I always relied on the people around us. I always had good teammates, and we, we tried to make the most fun out of it, but you know, the last couple of years, it got to a point where the racing seemed to be a little bit of a burden, and I was really enjoying the skiing aspect and the training, but for whatever reason, I, I wasn't really enjoying that racing. You know, my expectations are definitely lowered, and, and my goal is to go have fun, be around the guys, be in a competitive atmosphere, enjoy some of the social aspects of the World Pro Ski Tour, and really just take this last season to, to travel around and take some time to see some of the resorts where I would come to and, and not really explore as much when we were really locked in and focused for World Cup. I think this will give me the ability to step back a little bit and just kind of take a breath and enjoy it, like how it was when you were a kid. Just enjoy skiing. With the Tour Champ, and the ground starts to pull out ahead, but not by much. As we touch down off the bottom of the ground in control, Hayes back in his tail. He's going to be crowned, crossing the line first, and he wins the run by 0.195. Are you being audited? And do you owe the IRS $10,000 or more in back taxes? Is the IRS threatening to take more of your money? Don't fight the IRS alone. The Tax Doctor is here to help you negotiate your tax bill and reduce your stress. The IRS can freeze your assets and seize your bank accounts, but you can stop these IRS actions. The Tax Doctor will work with you using our years of experience to represent your case to help you get the best resolution under the IRS guidelines. Help is here to deal with the IRS to reduce your stress. We've handled thousands of cases, so we know what we're doing. If you owe $10,000 or more in back taxes, do not call the IRS alone. Call a tax doctor now for a tax emergency analysis. 800-881-2459. Non-attorney spokesperson. This is a paid advertisement for legal services sponsored by Nightline Legal. Cases assigned on a random basis to participating law firms. Attention cancer victims who use the weed killer Roundup. A federal jury unanimously found that Monsanto's popular weed killer Roundup was a substantial factor in causing cancer. You may be entitled to financial compensation. If you or a loved one used Roundup Weed Killer and were diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, call the number on your screen now. The World Health Organization has designated glyphosate, the main ingredient in Roundup Weed Killer, a probable human carcinogen. Thousands of agricultural workers may have been exposed to serious health risks by using this product. You may be owed significant compensation from the manufacturer. Call now to find out if you qualify. If you or someone you loved used Roundup and were diagnosed with cancer, Call the number on your screen now. Don't wait. There are time deadlines to file a claim. Call 800-880-3556. Hey, who's good at cooking? I mean, I can cook, but I don't know if it's going to go very well. Scrambled eggs, you know you're unsure eggs. about scrambled eggs. Well, dude, some people put in orange juice, some people put a little milk in, orange or some cheese. cheese. Yeah, dude, you've never put orange juice in it? Cooks real good. <laughs> I think I think just keep, keep, keep it simple, Steve. Maybe that's pancakes. <laughs> just you gonna crack them in there. Orange juice and pancakes? <laughs> no, you never oh, put food juice. in a cold pan. I love, them, I love putting orange like juice in my, uh, in my uh, spaghetti. Well, I want to yeah, put them in a bowl. Why don't you put them in a bowl? Yeah. I'm looking for a bowl. Dude. I don't live here. Go over there. Go <laughs> over Kind of throughout the year, we got a bunch of different venues, and it, ski racing in general is a pretty tight community. So um, people always seem to have, you know, friends in different areas, and um, I would say most people have an open door policy. So 
whenever the ski races are coming to town, there's usually somewhere you can find a place to stay. And here in Vail, um, Clay's family has been generous enough to let us use their property to, you know, hang out, tune our skis, eat meals and stuff. So it works really well. And throughout the year, everybody just kind of takes turns and kind of makes sure people have a roof over their head. Yeah, we put the wax on last night. I mean, it only really needs to sit for a couple hours, but um, we just let it sit overnight because we had time this morning. And then, yeah, scrape it off, brush it out. Hopefully they're good to go. Nolan? Yeah? You're up, buddy. You, you. Is you Patrick's for caddy? Oh, she's back. In the crowd. Uh, I'm going to... Yeah. 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 She was like, she was giving me quiet hours, so I wasn't allowed to like... Yeah, I'm a lot like younger than 16. most of them, I think. I mean, no one's really old. <laughs> but I'm I'm 23, and these guys are 28, 28, 30, 30. I'm the wily vet. turn 30, Yeah, in March. Yeah, I'm currently the oldest the oldest guy on the tour. Gotta show these young guys how to ski. Next up, we have Nolan Casper on the red course and Simone on the blue course, and a kind of neck and neck out of the start house. And both of those guys making some nice turns. We have Nolan Casper taking the lead with some cross blocking, and he takes over the win for that first run. I made the U.S. national team in 2007, um, so I was professional ski racing for the past 11 years. Well, for 11 years, and then after the 2018 Olympics. I retired, I moved to New York, started working in finance at my current job, and you know, now it's trying to manage work-life balance and get as much skiing as possible while also you know, doing my job. So it's uh, a lot less skiing than I used to get, but I think I've, given all the reps that I've done over the years, and I mean, I've been skiing for 25 years now, so it's... Uh, Something that hopefully I don't forget. So for me, it's it's good to stay involved with the community and see a lot of the people that I used to race against. Um, but you know, I'm still. I think it can still be competitive, and you know, this is a this is a new format that they started doing a bit on the World Cup. But you know, while I was racing World Cups, I didn't really have a lot of opportunity to do it. So. I think getting to do something a little bit different, a little new, is is exciting, and you know I'm I'm excited to, to keep doing this as long as uh, as long as my body holds up. There in the back, kind of enjoying the powder we had the other day, but uh, you know we gotta really get aggressive. He's cross blocking and such, but trying to be maybe a little too careful. And Nolan Casper will be the winner of that particular hit. Definitely planning on doing the whole tour. Um, it'll be. I mean, the nice thing is that a few of these are, are around the holidays, which is a little slower for us. Um, but it's definitely, I mean, it takes a commitment to, you know, it'll be flying on Friday after work and then red eyes on Sunday and straight back to the office on Monday. So it's uh, it's definitely a commitment that that I've got to make. And, you know, a few few others of us that are doing a similar program have to have to make the commitment to do it. And, you know, it's fun. We enjoy doing it. And that's why... Uh, we're willing to to take the effort to, to travel and, and to get places and, and, and to race. On goes Nolan Casper, Goldie. Yeah, Nolan really just showing that he belongs there in that particular run. And I advanced to the for the round of eight. Um, feels pretty good. It's definitely grooving up out there uh, with all the new snow we got recently. It's, uh, it's a bit softer, but we got a couple good grooves we got to push through, and you know, you really got to charge. This is a flatter hill and pretty straight course, so it's all gas. It was really interesting for me as an athlete to learn kind of how hard I could push myself, and, and that was always something I couldn't find in World Cup for whatever reason. Whereas here, when you have a 20-second course and you're head-to-head, 
there's just no holding back. You have to go all out right from the start. And that's something I've always been able to do. You know, you see a guy ahead, you figure out a way to go faster. When you're on your own in a slalom course, you kind of have to trust that you're skiing fast, but sometimes you're not, and, and you won't know until you get to the finish line. So it's that instant feedback of, either you're skiing well or you're skiing slow. Truly, I think that this is the future of ski racing, is this head-to-head -head format. Yeah. Surefoot's played a pretty big role in my career so far. I've had a relationship with them for the last five or six years. I've always used their insoles in my boots racing World Cup, and I've often stopped in at the Surefoot stores around the world to, you know, tweak my boots if I need anything or get them fit better. Partnering with the World Pro Ski Tour, I think it's, it's great to have them on board, and representing the company on an individual basis as an athlete has, is a really exciting opportunity for me, and I look forward to representing them and, and working with Surefoot through the winter. Yeah, I found last year, you know, especially in the early rounds, uh, if I was qualified, you know, as a high seed and you're racing somebody who's maybe at a lower ability level, there's definitely a little bit of strategy involved in that and, and how you approach the run. Not to say you can't respect the other competitor, but you have to kind of gauge, you know, how fast they are versus how fast you believe you can be and make sure that no mistakes happen, right? Because if you lose focus for a second, then you're out of the course. Out goes Colin Hayes. It's going to be Phil. Brown facing off against Alex Lieber in the round of eight. That was good. Happy to make it through the first round, and I think it'll get tougher now. But uh, yeah, always nice to get going and kind of feel the body heating up. And got to go against Alex now. So I don't know. He's skied a lot, so he's got a little bit of a leg up, but. I'm a competitor, so we'll see what happens. I think I can beat him. And Lever out of the gate first. He had the advantage in the first round. Brown is going to have some work to do to even have a chance at trying to catch him. But Lever over the jump, way out ahead, over a gate ahead of Brown. Brown is just trying to do whatever he can to stay in the course and straighten it out. But Lever cruises down through the bottom gates with an easy victory over Brown. What an upset. Where was downtown Phil Brown today? Uh, I mean, it was Okay, I, I made a mistake uh, one round against Alex and then couldn't make up the time, but uh, yeah, not my ideal conditions and not a bad start overall, but you know, uh, a little bit disappointed. The fun part is chasing someone down, the scary part is hearing someone chase you down. You can, you can definitely hear them get closer if they're having a really good run, you had a little mistake, you're ahead of them from the start, you can hear them get closer and coach you like, oh, oh my god, I really need to push again. And so you're just panicking at the end, like hearing them catch, because they can catch you within the last gate. And that's it. <laughs> I think with practice, it becomes less intimidating because, you know, we've all skied for 20 plus years and we are comfortable, you know, on our skis pretty much in all conditions. So I've noticed uh, a couple of times last year when I had to cut off the line and just convince myself to go straight at the gate off the jump and you know, I might land in the gate as I'm coming down, but just put your hands up, go through it, and try to, you know, make up that extra one-tenth of a second that you need to advance. All ski racing is is going around a gate left and right, left and right, but the Pro Tour really throws in a little kink in there. You gotta jump now, or two, or sometimes three, where you're going, you're going on a six-foot jump in the middle of a course where you just came off your ski edge and you've got way too much energy you're already out of control and then you're airborne. And so like that definitely throws a big thing in. You've gotta be prepared before you go off the jump because you can hurt yourself. You've gotta be focused for when you land because normally you're not taking a hit of an impact and then arcing in a turn like you are on the pro tour. It's definitely a, a big adjustment, especially doing 10 runs of it if you're making all the finals. Like your body starts to break down, your back gets compressed every single time you go off the jump and every turn you make anyway. So it's an abusive sport, but it's really fun. Not easily as they touch down off the bottom. You have to like land or go off with the premonition of where you're gonna land and how much energy you're gonna need on impact. So what these do is helps us just get our muscles and everything primed for that reactive movement. So sticking to landing and being in balance is very important. As soon as you're out of balance, everything can go wrong. 
So this is a different aspect. It's like what we were talking about where you jump and then you're pushing off of one leg, exploding like you're going through a, tour, a turn. So you just go. And again, like Derek was saying, sticking to landing, being solid, or stabilized. Yeah. Never and you can, you can land on two feet or one feet, but really being able to get the power off of one leg is important. And then you're basically in your next turn. You don't want to tax yourself, but you want your muscles to be firing. So exercises like this, which, you know, you don't have 300 pounds on your back, but you're still getting your left legs to explode so that when we're in the course tomorrow, our muscles are ready to fire and do what we need them to do. This is just about engaging your glutes as well as your back in an orderly fashion, which is very important for me because it wants to spaz up even while I'm just doing this. Um, but yeah, we just want our muscles primed and ready. If you think a tin shed can hold up like a tough shed, you're in for a big surprise. After 38 years, our buildings speak for themselves. Dream, design, and build at toughshed.com. Here is a place situated off the map of ordinary, a place that is independent, free-spirited, and intimate in scale. A place that since its first lift was installed over 60 years ago, has strived to stay true to its roots while growing better rather than bigger. This vision for the future has helped make us the first ski resort in the world to earn B Corp certification. It's a symbol of where we're headed and what we stand for. We hope you will join us. My name is Simon, Breitfuss Kammerlando. I'm 27 and I'm born in Austria and I'm racing for Bolivia. Simon Kammerlando from Austria and his duo... I started skiing when I was two and a half in Austria. I was skiing all the time. When I was 23, I started really with racing, these races, and, and I did the last three years. I did the World Cups, the Olympics, and World Championships. It's the first time, yeah. I'm racing here, it's, I'm excited for this. My dad was a pro racer ago in the past, and yeah, I was always, uh, I knew about this. And now it's, it's great that the guys bring back the pro tour again. My name is Rainer Breitfuss. Uh, I'm from Austria, and yes, I have three kids and my wife. My dad was, uh, also a pro racer. First he was a ski instructor, and then he changed to the racing. He was racing in South America and in a Japan tour. And after that, he was like a coach. He was coaching. And the last five, six, seven years, he was only coaching with me. Here, really consistent, so it'll be tough. You know, all I have uh, many things to do. So I'm, I'm also the coach of Simon. This is uh, a lot of work. Also, only to prepare the skis and yeah, the whole traveling, what we, we go for, for, for example, after the race also, we have to drive and uh, so this, it's, it needs a lo lot of organization. But we know this a little because we raced the World Cup last year. I'll help you out here, buddy. Yeah. Commander, he's going to cross the line first. His first run. Let's take a look at the difference there. So, we are here with the camping car. We was looking for options, you know, for the whole, for this time now. And for us, it was the best option. Rent all this uh, camping car and going around. We have everything here, what we need. It was for us the best option. Hey, 
the next race, we had Nolan Casper on the blue course, and we had Simone on the red course. Nolan Casper with a .26 advantage over Simone as they go over that first jump. We have a, we have Norlin Casper in the lead. Simone digging digging deep, looking for that straightest line as possible to gain some time on Nolan Casper. Photo finish at the bottom. Wow. Casper out. It was a hard fight, yeah. I was, uh, Nolan was in lead in the start, almost a half a gate, and I tried to keep up, and I got a perfect line to the finish before the last jump, and I was pushing so hard to the finish, and finally I was in lead. It was so close, but it was fun to race. Yeah. I go now, I think, with Garrett, and I saw him racing, he did a good job, so I'm excited to battle it out with him. We was training before in, in Pitstall. From there we went to, to Vienna, it was like a drive of six hours. Then we took the plane, came here, 18 hours, 18, 19 hours to Denver. We slept there one day. Next day we get this car and we came here. With the jet lag and all these time, time changes, it was quite funny, but at the moment I feel good. Attention, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services has officially authorized new benefits that Medicare Advantage plans may include. To get the benefits you deserve, you can call the Medicare Coverage Helpline. Hi, I'm Joe Namath. If you're on Medicare, this is important information. I called the Medicare Coverage Helpline and they instantly looked up my coverage. In this one simple call, they offered to enroll me in a plan that includes rides to medical appointments, private home aides, doctors and nurses visits by telephone, and even home delivered meals. The plan also includes dental, vision, hearing, and prescription drug coverage, all at no additional cost. Don't delay. Call to see if the new benefits are available in your area. Call the number on your screen now. It's free. Call 1-800-413-8510. That's 1-800-413-8510. Here's our semifinals bracket. First up, Cone versus Lever, and then Kamalander versus Driller. The track's getting established. There's, it's a little soft, and we're all, we all want the same fast line, so we're kind of digging through the soft snow. And who you got next? Uh, I have Alex Lever in this heat. Think you got him? Yeah, hopefully, hopefully I'm a good one. Even though his timing is just so on, his quick to quick edge sets have just been so powerful all day. He just really seems to gain more time on his opponent. The lever continues to fall back just a little bit and the course is getting shorter. Course is getting shorter and there's not much real estate left here on the bottom. Cone rides across the line with a win easily. Skiing, it, for me, it's, it's everything. It's the passion. When I started skiing with two and a half, three years, there was only skiing for me. I made the decision to, to gonna be a professional racer. When I say I do something, I'm gonna do it. And so for me, it was, I was always keep on going, pushing, training, and I did the best of the situation. Was not ever, was not so easy. And like skiing, it's, I don't know, it's something, something special. It's like Formula One, but without an engine. So what you do, it's, uh, you do it with the body. And I think this is some parts of the, of the sports which made it so interesting. When I'm in a course, I feel free. I don't think so much about anything. It's only the way down. It's a good feeling to, to reach something, to, to get better, to improve the skills, and always to keep on going, working forward. It's only one way for the sport I like. And they're off. 
right out of the gate. Both of them charging. Kamalander has that slight advantage. Driller knows he's going to have to make it up, but it really isn't that much time. He's just going to have to hustle. Oh, massive mistake by Simone there. You saw that. Simone got in the tails of his skis and it launched him like a catapult into that next turn. Driller's taking full advantage of that mistake by Kamalander. And there just isn't enough real estate to get the job done. There goes to Driller. And it's Garrett Driller who will advance to the finals. In the small final, it will be Alex Lever up against Simone Redfuss Kamalander. And in the big final event of the day, it will be Robert Cohn up against Garrett Driller. So we're coming in the finals. Uh, this is the big finals going for second run. Cohn's got me by a bit in the first one, um, four tenths. So I gotta, gotta make that up on him, but I think uh, if, I, if I ski smart, ski strong in that red course, I think I got it. So I'm gonna push out of the gate hard and go for it. So I'm uh, pretty sure I'm in the final now, uh, facing Garrett Driller. And uh, we just had the first half of that, uh, that final, the first heat, um, and I did sneak a little little bit of an edge on Garrett. So excited to uh, still be balancing this run and keep it moving. Red course ready, blue course ready. Driller has a lot of work to do, but can he make it up? And there is a lot on the line right now, Mark. There's $10,000 for the winner. Cone way out in front, but Garrett's not gonna let him take it that easy. Who wants this more, Cone or Driller? Watch Driller, he is scrapping. He is trying to straighten it out as best he can. Cone smoothly coming down to the bottom, but look at Driller, it's still alive, it's Cone! Robert Cohn is the winner of the inaugural Pepe Grom Summer Cup. Oh, number one today, Garrett Driller, number two, Lieber, and Kamalander will meet you in the finish corral for our award ceremony. In first place, from Killington, Vermont, Robert Cohn. How about a bigger round of applause for Robert? <laughs> and Shaika, now would you present the Pepe Grom Summer Cup? It's been a great day here in Vale of Racing. We'll see you in a few weeks' time at Hollison Hill in Steamboat, Colorado. All right, see you guys in Steamboat.